How many of you have heard a sermon on the subject of fasting? Who's heard a sermon on fasting? How many of you want to hear a sermon on fasting? <laughs> well, let's turn once again to Matthew chapter 6. Uh, last time we ended on the subject of prayer, but we're going to be talking about uh, fasting this morning. The title of the message, Fasting and Putting God First. The last time we ended on prayer, and I'd explained the Lord's Prayer. Jesus said, do not be like the heathen. We talked about vain repetitions and what that meant. I said, God cares about us. We are his children. He wants to answer our prayers. And of course, as a good father, uh, you know, sometimes good parents have to say no to their children. And the child might at the moment not understand that. But as they grow up, they recognize that it's necessary. How many of you have come to that recognition that when my parents said no, or that, that, that was actually for the best? Well, the same with us when we first start following Christ. There's a lot of things that God does. A lot of times he may say no and we don't understand why. But the more we grow and mature in the faith, then we start to understand things better. And hopefully we take that and pass it along to others. Uh, the more people who do this, the stronger the church will be, the stronger families will be, and the stronger families and stronger churches leads to a more just and stable society. Uh, but along the same lines, so we were talking about prayer, now we're going to talk about fasting, because prayer and fasting often go hand in hand, or um, they, they should. Uh, when you fast, you also pray. So I've, I've titled the message, Fasting and Putting God First. Several subjects we're going to cover. Let's begin by reading Matthew 6, 16 through 18. Jesus says, Moreover, when you fast, do not be like the hypocrites with a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces that they may appear to be fasting to men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, so that you do not appear to men to be fasting, but to your Father who is in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. So talking about fasting, um, what, is, what does that mean? I, th I think we know, right? Fasting means you're, you're not eating, or you're not drinking. Uh, the first meal of the day is called breakfast. So break, you're breaking your fast. The idea is, at least in time past, you haven't eaten since the previous uh, evening at dinner. So you wake up and you break your fast. But when most people talk about fasting today, or when people do fast today, usually it's because they have a, a surgery, procedure, uh, maybe a blood test or something, so people will fast for those reasons. But the context here refers to abstaining as a religious exercise from food and or drink, either entirely if the fast lasted a single day, or from only certain things if the fast uh, continued for many days. So either no food and or drink for an entire day or several days you would give up something. So this is fasting. I think we all understand that. It's a religious exercise. It's, it's a spiritual discipline. And a lot of people don't do it because uh, churches rarely preach on, on the subject. And this is one of the benefits of going chapter by chapter, verse by verse through the scripture, where if a pastor wasn't inclined to preach on the subject, uh, well, here we are. We're, we're coming to it in the text. So I had said that prayer and fasting were often connected. Uh, people would either fast because they were sad, right? they were mourning. You've heard of the expression, it's, it's in the Bible. Um, you're, you're in sackcloth and ashes. Right? So people would fast and they would, they would wear something and they would put ash over their head and it was a sign that they were in mourning, they had suffered loss. Other times, people would fast uh, to draw closer to God, and that's, that's really the, the focus this morning. So why fast? Why do you need to fast to draw closer to God? And, and I wouldn't say that you have to, 
but it is one way people do that. Uh, you've probably noticed this. After you eat, how do you feel after you eat? Well, oftentimes you feel a little tired. And if you eat too much, you feel a little sluggish, right? Uh, this is all pretty common. When we indulge, really our senses oftentimes become a little dull. So if you want, the idea is if you want to give God maximum attention, it's helpful to fast. I'm sure there's a reason why your body reacts in, in these ways. Your mind seems more clear, but uh, that's what happens when you fast. Now, I, I would say this, that there is no commandment that Christ, you know, thou shalt fast or so often, so many times a month or something like that. It is not a commandment. And that's probably why a lot of people don't do it because it isn't a commandment. However, Jesus says, we read this, when you fast, right? So what's the implication? That he, he understands his disciples will from time to time, they will fast. Just a few examples of fasting in the Bible. In Acts chapters 13 and 14, the believers fasted before they made important decisions. Uh, Jesus fasted in the wilderness, 40 days and 40 nights before he began his public ministry. So fasting is a good spiritual exercise to devote a time away from the normal things of life and to focus solely upon the Lord. Might I suggest a type of fast that some of us could use a fast from television? Amen? Can I get an amen on that? Uh, some of you don't want to do that, but it would, it would be beneficial. So point of bringing that up, it's not just fasting from, from food. Uh, it's fasting from your, your smartphone. It's fasting from television. You could give up something and focus solely upon the Lord. Beneficial thing. So this passage in Matthew chapter 6, it ends by Jesus telling his disciples to seek first the kingdom of God. This is what we want to do, right? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. So fasting can help us to do that. I pulled this article offline. I just want to read some of this. I think it'll be helpful. Fasting is a way to demonstrate to God and to ourselves that we are serious about our relationship with him. Fasting helps us gain a new perspective and a renewed reliance upon God. Anything given up temporarily in order to focus all our attention on God can be considered a fast. Fasting should be limited to a set time, especially when fasting from food. Extended periods of time without eating can be harmful to the body. Uh, fasting is not intended to punish the flesh, but to redirect attention to the Lord. Fasting should not be, and this is what some people think of when they think of fasting, their mind automatically goes here, but fasting should not be considered a dieting method. The purpose of a biblical fast is not to lose weight, but rather to gain deeper fellowship with God. Anyone can fast, but some may not be able to fast from food, diabetics, for example. But everyone can temporarily give up something in order to draw closer to God. So I would just ask you to maybe consider a few things. Is there something tomorrow, this week, at some point, is there something I could fast from to focus uh, more on the Lord? And that's something that you, that's between you and God. But it's just helpful, taking our eyes off the things of this world to put our attention on Christ. It should be noting, uh, noted that fasting is not a way to get God to do what we want. <laughs> that's, that's not the purpose. Fasting does not change God. Fasting changes who? Us. Also, fasting is not a way to appear more spiritual than others. Fasting is to be done in a spirit of humility and a joyful attitude. Now that's important to the context of our passage, that fasting is not a way to show everybody, hey, look at me. And remember we were talking about the, the Pharisees and the religious leaders, when they pray, they would do it in public so everyone saw them. Uh, the clothing they would wear, they, they would wear certain things to get attention. That's not what fasting is about. If you were fasting, people wouldn't even know it, right? So when you fast, don't be like who? 
Jesus says, yeah, don't be like the Pharisees. Don't be like the hypocrites. Look at verse 16. Christ says, moreover, when you fast, do not be like them. Do not be like the hypocrites with a sad countenance. For they disfigure their faces so that they may appear to men to be fasting. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. So what does that mean, disfigure their faces? Well, one thing that comes to mind is when people, and I think some people do, they put a look on their face or they just, so when you see them, someone's going to ask, hey, what's going on? How are you doing? And they intentionally maybe put on a face to let everyone know uh, how sad they are. But here's another thing they would do. They would actually smear ash over their head, on their face, so that when people saw them, they would know, hey, this person is, is in a fast. And Jesus says, do this? No, he says, don't do that. Jesus identifies the people who would do that, put ash on their face, disfigure their face. He identifies them as hypocrites. He says they're only doing it for show. They're doing it for show, so they have their reward. What's their reward? The praises of men. Look how spiritual this person is. After all, they're fasting. So instead of doing that, Jesus tells his followers in verse 17, but you, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face. Don't let anyone know. This way, your father, who sees in secret, will reward you openly. Now let's because this whole sermon isn't on the subject of fasting, we're going to move on to the next thing. But let's, uh, before we do that, let's make application. Does anyone do this today? Does anyone fast and take ash or put something on their face to make it obvious, evident to everyone that, hey, I'm fasting? Well, uh, some of you may know uh, where I'm going with this. Uh, within Roman Catholicism, you have, we've talked about this before, you have what is called Fat Tuesday or Mardi Gras. And this is typically when people indulge themselves because the next day is Ash Wednesday, which marks the beginning of the, the season of Lent. What do people do during Lent? Yeah, they give up something. They fast. They fast for the Lord. So the idea is to get all the excess out of your system on Mardi Gras so that on Ash Wednesday you can begin your fast. And how do they mark this fast? Uh, what? Why do they call it Ash Wednesday? Well, they take the palm branches from Palm Sunday the year before. They take the ash and they smear it on the person's forehead. They smear it on their face to let everyone know, I am fasting for Lent. You realize that's the exact opposite of what Jesus Christ said to do. And I don't say that to be critical. It's just another reminder that you know, tradition is a weird thing. Churches and professing Christians can do things and they think they're doing the right thing but they didn't get it from the Bible. This is a tradition. They're actually contradicting the teachings of Christ. So don't do it that way. If you fast, tell, are you going to tell everyone? Are you going to walk around with a kind of a puss on your face? No. <laughs> if you fast, don't tell anyone. This is between you and God. Okay. So now Jesus, in the next few verses, 19 through 21, this is titled, Lay Up Treasures in heaven. Jesus says, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures where? In heaven, in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So we can think about this. Is my treasure here on earth? And we all have things that we care about. But do you really love those things more than you love God? Or do you love God? Is your treasure in heaven? Where is your heart? Is it with the Lord or is it with stuff? I mean, this is something that can affect uh, just about anyone and probably does. So just as the purpose of fasting is to take your eyes off the things of the world to focus more on God, the thing that most commonly distracts people from God is materialism, you know, money, the things of the world. Uh, Jesus uses the word treasures, and really that doesn't necessarily refer to gold and silver and precious stones. Uh, treasure can refer to basically anything 
that you treasure. Uh, in the ancient world, they treasured clothing and, and property and, and, well, it's pretty similar today, right? These, these are the things that people really care about. Let's turn to 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. But treasures, uh, money, the comfort of life, all the creature comforts. You know, there's nothing necessarily wrong with some of these things, but it can... It can really control a person. It can draw us away from God. Putting money above God. What, what's the word for that? When you put something above God. Yeah, idolatry. Look at 1 Timothy 6, verse 6. Now, godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing... With these, we shall be content. Are people content with just food and clothing? <laughs> Most people are not content. The Lord tells us to be content, though. Verse 9. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and harmful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But you, O man of God, Paul speaking to Timothy, flee these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and gentleness. What's he saying? These are the things that really matter. A clear conscience before God is more valuable than any lump sum of money. A clear conscience, being right with God, having hope. These are things money can't buy. Because those who seek after money, I think we realize this, it maybe doesn't change someone's opinion, but people who seek after money, you know, how much is enough? I mean, ask Bill Gates, how much, Bill, how much is enough? I don't know, I don't, maybe he has an answer for that. But this is the way people are, how much is enough? So what's the principle? Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So where is your treasure this morning? Again, between you and God, you can just ask that. What do you delight in the most? Is it a person, the Lord Jesus Christ? Is it other people? Is it material things? Okay, let's turn back to Matthew chapter 6. But obviously money can be an idol. Nothing wrong with money necessarily. There's some Old Testament characters who are very wealthy and very godly. So this isn't, you know, a sermon just against the rich or something like that. But money, it's dangerous Money is an idol. This is the idol of mammon. The idol of mammon. Uh, very prevalent in the world today. And the more you seek it, the more you want it. And obviously people do some terrible things for money. But if your heart is where it's supposed to be, delighting in God, that helps set everything else in its proper order. Otherwise, the danger is if we love things more than people, if we love treasure more than God, we're going to come up empty. What if you died the richest person in the world, but you didn't know Christ? Or you died the richest person on earth, and you had nobody there with you. All of your relationships were severed and broken. What good is that? See, my goal in life is not to uh, store up a certain amount of money, uh, get th these things and acquire that. You know, the things that really matter to me, I need to keep things in their proper priority. I think you do as well. We need to put who first, right? Seek God first. Seek the kingdom of God. You know, the things that are important to me, the most important thing to me is that uh, when I pass into eternity that I go to be with the Lord. That, that is the most important thing for me, and it's the most important thing for you and my desire for you. Because what does it profit a man if he should gain the whole world and yet lose his own soul? So by putting God first, everything else then should be 
in its proper uh, priority. Otherwise, here's what you get. Solomon in Ecclesiastes 1.14. If you've never read the book of Ecclesiastes, it's, some people say this is like the most depressing book in the Bible. And well, that might be true. But what's it about? It's, it's a life without God. Seeking pleasure in things. Solomon wrote in Ecclesiastes 1.14. I have seen all that the works, or I've seen all the works that are done under the sun, and indeed all is what? Vanity and grasping for the wind. So we can lay hold on eternal life, or we can be left grasping for the wind. Look at verse 22. And all of these things Jesus is talking about are at least loosely connected. He says, the lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. How, how can we make sure it's good? Put God first. But, verse 23, if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? A lot of people have a hard time understanding what Jesus is saying here. Uh, one commentator writes this, this is an argument from the lesser to the greater. The analogy is simple. If your eye is bad, no light can come in, and you are left with darkness because of that malady. So if you're blind, no light is coming in. You can't see. How much worse, then, the problem is, not merely related to external perception, but an internal corruption of one's whole nature, so that the darkness actually emanates from within and affects one's whole being. This is why people need to be born again and receive that new nature in Christ, because our nature, all of us, from day one, being born into this world, our natural tendencies are, have a bent away from God. Not towards God, away from God. And these idols help keep people fixed in their bent away from God. What are the main idols in our society? Well, again, mammon, material wealth, and I think sex. Sex and money is what drives the world. Sex and money is what is driving American culture. We live in a materialistic society, right? I don't think you're gonna get any arguments about that. And we all get affected by it. So the question is, is God going to have his rightful place in our life, on top, number one, or are things number one? Are we seeking after stuff? Or maybe a person could be an idol to you. So that's the choice that we have. And if we're seeking after money, or certainly if we're seeking after ungodly things, then the darkness isn't just the fact that no light is getting in. The darkness is within. Verse 24, so this is our choice. Jesus says, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and what? Mammon. Mammon. What's that? Wealth, treasure, materialism. You cannot serve God and that. Therefore, I say to you, do not worry about your life and what you will eat, and what you will drink, nor about your body and what you will put on. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? And the reason Jesus says this is he knows this is what people do. They're all worried about the things of life. What am I going to wear? And do I have the, the brand name clothing that's, you know, usually young kids deal with that. And, and we're, we're worried about all of this worldly stuff. And, and what good does that worry do? Zero. It, it does no good at all. But when you're worldly minded, this is where people uh, put their focus. You worry uh, not a, just about those things. Today, a lot of people worry about like current events, right? The things of this world. Uh, people worry today about the things that the world tells them to worry about. 
You know, I said some people would do well uh, if they took a fast from television. And I realize I'm preaching right now and I might not make uh, too many friends with this one. But you know, do you realize much of what gets reported out there as news is manipulation? They want you to be worried about this thing, and then there's the next big thing, and you need to be worried about that. And they, what they're doing is they're playing both sides against the middle, and it creates an unnecessary level of anxiety. People are anxious because they're worried about things that are sometimes never going to affect them. And I think the devil can use that. So it's not just materialism. You'd be worried about just any worldly thing that takes your mind away from, from Christ. When you have money, when you have a lot of stuff, what do you end up doing? You worry about keeping it. You worry about how you can get more. And this isn't a sermon about giving away all your possessions and joining a monastery or something like that. That's not, that's not it. But if we are not feeling fulfilled, there's, there's a reason for that. God is probably not in his rightful place if we are not feeling fulfilled fulfilled. Most people are seeking after creature comforts instead of seeking after the creator who has already provided for us in abundance. Has God provided for you? I know we could all think about the things that we want or the things that we don't have, things that we can't afford and all the rest, but look at the things that you do have. Has God been good to you? Has God provided for you? If you live in this country, he has. Uh, he does it everywhere, but especially here. Look at verse 28. So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon, in all his glory, was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? You, you realize Solomon was the greatest, up until that time, he was the greatest king the world had ever seen. Solomon was a man who literally had everything. He had it all. And yet, the book of Ecclesiastes is sort of like his autobiography about all the wealth, all the power, all the fame. What did it do? Did it make, it make him happy? No. It made him, what? Miserable because he did not put God first. He said, all is vanity. Solomon became an idolater. He took God down and put something in his rightful place. Just consider, uh, we're almost done, but the way we live today. In this country, we live like kings. I don't care if you're on the lower end of things, you still live, live like a king compared to how most people have lived throughout history. It's true, and, and what do we do? We still end up grumbling and complaining, and it does, I don't have this, and, I, and it's just not fair. Or we worry. You know that's true. <laughs> So what's the advice that Jesus gives? Look at verse 33. Therefore, what? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these other things will be added unto you. He goes back uh, in verse 31. Therefore, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For after all these things, the Gentiles seek. So when we act like that, we're actually acting like an unbeliever instead of being focused and appreciative on, on all the good things that God has done. He says, for your heavenly father knows that you have need of all these things, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things will be added unto you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. And this is some parting advice, okay? So the rest of the day, Put this into practice today, tomorrow. Do not worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will worry about its own things. God is going to provide. God is going to care for you. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. So here's the advice. Take things one day at a time. I don't know about you, but God has always provided for me in abundance, above and beyond not just my basic needs, 
Um, he has provided, yeah, we, we do live like royals. It, not compared to royals today, compared to people 100 years ago, 500 years ago. We have it so very good, amen? amen? Do you recognize that? We have it so very good. And God has provided most of all by sending his son into this world to die on the cross for our sin. So that's the most important thing of all. Seek first the kingdom. How do we seek the kingdom? We seek the king. Remember Jesus' original message when he began his preaching ministry back in chapter 4. Repent for the kingdom is at hand. Jesus is the king. Seek him. We seek the righteousness of God when we seek the righteous one sent by God. If the Lord is in his proper place, everything else will be taken care of. So seek first the kingdom of God. Amen? All right, let's close. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this simple message to put God first. And Lord, if we're distracted by the things of this world, uh, by whatever it is, uh, television, stress, uh, other people trying to draw us away, uh, Lord, I just pray if, if fasting is what it takes to take a, a day or two and to deprive ourselves from some things just to prove to ourselves we can do it and to show to you we're serious, Lord, I just pray that each and every one of us would pursue our relationship with you through Christ, that we would pursue that first and make Christ first in our lives. And if someone's never done that, if someone's never trusted in Jesus, I pray today they would say, Lord, I realize you are God and I need to start putting you first. I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sin and rose again. And because he rose again, he is Lord. He is my Lord and I will forever put him first. And we pray these things in Jesus' name, amen.